I'm Father Raymond Kemp. I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of Washington and a native Washingtonian, and it's the reason why I'm wearing this hat. Can we hear it for the Nats? Hip, hip. Thank you. Wow. Um, John asked me to say uh, a few words of introduction for him and for this event tonight, and um, I'm going to get real serious real quick. A word about the Institute. First of all, thank you for coming. Thank you for finding your way to Lorfink if you're new to the campus. It is not the easiest place to find. Give yourself a round of applause for finding it. Um, this topic tonight is something that has uh, taken on a life of its own, not just at the university, but around the country and around the world. I was at a meeting last week with some representatives from UNESCO who are planning a, a meeting in slavery, and one of our panelists was there. We're, we're looking forward to um, this thing growing into something where we begin to understand our contemporary times in light of our own past. Um, I think the, uh, the initiative that John Carr and um, all that Pope Francis has meant to the initiative that John Carr heads has done something for Georgetown University, John, that I know you envisioned and all of your benefactors who are here um, deserve a big, big hug um, just for bringing a Catholic identity sense of the both the importance of our activity witnessing in the public square to the power of Catholic social teaching to the presence of Jesus and to bringing our graduates and other young Catholic professionals into swing, into sway with all that's going on in this world of ours. The civil discussion in Washington and Georgetown's capacity to focus that discussion are very, very incredible. Um, to share Catholic social teaching more broadly and more deeply here at the university, in the city and around the country, to promote civil and substantive dialogue across political, re religious, and ideological lines took quite a uh, turn for, the, for uh, a big public at the Poverty Summit with Robert Putnam, David Brooks, and it's rare that the President of the United States will sit in a panel, um, and that was uh, quite a moment that we had. But I think, too, Pope Francis has done as much as anyone for the success of of the efforts of the Institute. It's become an important part, the Institute of Georgetown, a respected place of dialogue in the nation's capital. And I think we've seen over the months and years of its existence, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 folks. Um, John Carr is the person who I'm called to introduce. But before I do, I want to say a word about Ray Kemp in 1967, getting himself ordained a priest for Washington, D.C., and finding his first assignment in a segregated Catholic camp in Southern Maryland at Holy Angels in Avenue and Camp St. Florence. And my first pastoral mission was to accompany the, it was called the Colored Catholic Sodality of Holy Angels Parish in Avenue, Maryland, on their annual trip to New York City. I was to say a mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And lo and behold, we got there at 6.30. We knocked on the door and nobody was home. We had a little breakfast and came back. It's the only mass I ever said in Latin like this. Um, but it was an incredible experience and it was my introduction or reintroduction, if you will, to the African-American Catholic community in the Archdiocese of Washington in Southern Maryland. I went from there to St. Augustine's, where I spent 19 years. I then spent another wonderful six at St. Cyprian's, both historic African-American Catholic parishes in Washington, D.C. When most people hear the story of the Jesuits and the Maryland Plantation, 
the Catholic plantation owning and then selling slaves, they kind of stop at that sale. What I have realized over the last year and a half is that I had the stunning experience of pastoring what those descendants built in two stunning African-American Catholic parishes, in two incredible schools staffed by the Oblate Sisters of Providence, and in becoming part of a Catholic presence across this globe and beyond, I mean across this country and beyond, that to me just um, my heart skips a beat when I think about it. It's an incredible story and one that I hope to be able to share um, as I hit my dotage and begin to write a few notes. Without further ado, though, let me introduce John, who's brought together a wonderful panel of good friends. And John Carr and I go back 30 years. A new pharaoh came to Washington who did not remember Joseph. That's not entirely the case. A new archbishop came to Washington. His name was James Hickey, and he decided he would reorganize the Archdiocese of Washington. And he went advertising for positions. And a bunch of mutual friends of ours introduced us to one another. And we then began to work for six years together, implementing a variety of plans in the Archdiocese of Washington from, I was there from 86. Before that, John had worked the White House Conference on Family and multiple other uh, operation. Subsequent to that, worked for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, thanks be to God, and where he did a lot of work. And then for the last 25 years, John was a constant presence on Walter Burkhart's Preaching the Just Word retreat workshops for priests around the country. Um, John, the friendship over 30 years and the presence that we've had one to another has been nothing short of inspiring for me. I know you're going to do a great job with this thing tonight. Onward. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ray. Nice of you to dress up for the evening. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is great. The Jesuit has a collar and the diocesan priest doesn't. Uh, uh, Ray and I, as he said, have been friends for decades, and uh, he has been a friend, a colleague, a pastor, an ally. And when I was thrilled to come to Georgetown, uh, people in the president's office said, uh, uh, you're going to be here, what turned out to be Milady Hall, I didn't know at the time. And they said, you're right down the hall from Father Kemp. And I said, that's wonderful. Uh, we were together for all those years. I'm dying to find out what Father Kemp does here. And uh, an unnamed person in the president's office said, well, when you find out, it's important you tell us. <laughs> uh, the truth is, Ray is the heart and soul of Georgetown. He is our mission and identity. He teaches, he consoles, he counsels, he, he is a cheerleader, which is harder work than it used to be for the basketball team. Uh, he's a great friend. But most of all, he reminds us that Georgetown is not an island, that it's part of a change, changing and complicated and diverse city, a divided city. Uh, he is a bridge builder. He was a Pope Francis priest before there was a Pope Francis, so we're honored to have him. Uh, be a part of this and connect it to the ongoing work and uh, legacy that tonight represents. Uh, because of our common work in the Archdiocese of Washington, I had a vague notion that the Jesuits owned slaves. But it was a footnote, not a headline, for me at least. And then it was a headline. You probably saw the stories. People on this panel uh, knew it much more directly, intimately than I did. But it got personal. Uh, it was no longer a vague national shame, but a story of particular human beings sold at a particular time and place for a particular purpose. And part of that purpose was to fund the institution that I was now a part of. Uh, my daughter who teaches in Central City, Baltimore, has been trying to explain to me what white privilege is. Well, that is at least one definition 
of white privilege. Uh, students protested and organized. Uh, others researched and shared the story. Alumni got involved. And a remarkable working group was formed. And two members of that working group are with us. And if you have not read that report, you need to. And then our president received that report and stepped up. Uh, often it's said when you come back to school, what did you do this summer? Well, part of what President DeJoya did this last summer was reach out to the descendants of those people, those enslaved people, to uh, talk about who they were, where they come from, and what their relationship to the institution might be. So we have a situation that is not unique, but I think a response that is unique. And I think part of that uniqueness comes from who we are, what we believe, and where we come from. Great evil was done, but great good can come from that because of who we are, what we believe, and how we act. And so tonight we want to take a look at how our Jesuit identity, our Catholic mission, these principles can shape how we confront our past. And to help us begin that conversation, we have Dr. Marsha Chatelain, who is an associate professor of history and African American studies at Georgetown University. She was a member of the working group. I first saw her not wandering through Healy, but on MSNBC <laughs> as she was explaining what was going on. Uh, she's a native of Chicago. She's the author of the book, Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration. She's received awards here for her teaching. Uh, she graduated uh, from Missouri, I believe, and taught in Oklahoma City, or the University of Oklahoma. She uh, developed a syllabus called uh, Hashtag Ferguson Syllabus, which provided tools for teachers and parents to respond to the violence that we all saw. She's written a lot, and I had a chance to read some of that. And the line that stuck to me at the end of one of her pieces was, I do hope that what Georgetown students, as well as the nation, learn is that our greatest liberation will only come when we tell the most painful, detailed, and fullest of truths. So tonight, we're asking Dr. Chatelain to share the truth with us, at least in a very brief form. Thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Um, that's all right. It happens to all of us. Um, good evening. I feel like in a crowd like this, I have to say, you know, baptized at St. Edith Church, you know, First Communion at St. Margaret Mary, um, confirmation as well. Um, this is such a, a great audience um, to talk about the work of the working group. I think between um, me and Matt Carnes and the other members of the working group, we've probably talked about this. It's a divine inspiration. So um, I think we've probably talked about this to many audiences, but rarely do we get an opportunity to talk to an audience oriented in the challenges and opportunities that Catholic social thought brings to us. And so I think that um, what's most important to understand about the working group isn't the fact that we were tasked to tell a truth that many of us knew, but maybe we're not ready to confront, but rather the context in which this conversation is happening. Before we started the panel, Father Kemp and I were chatting a bit, and you said over a 50-year span of service um, to your faith and to this city, you see some of the same things happening again. And as I get older, the sense that the past is, is reignited and reanimated in front of you and asking you new questions about how to respond to it, I, I take that very seriously. And, and I'd like to think about how this moment tells us something about Georgetown's history, a history that people had engaged with before. When we think about the history of slavery and our nation and Georgetown University, we would be um, making a terrible mistake if we started with the sale of 272 in 1838. The history of slavery is the history of the new nation. 
It is the orientation, the foundation of what was possible, not only in this area, but across the country. And when we think about the Jesuit presence in Maryland in 1634, um, evidence of Jesuit slaveholding as early as 1717, um, a full 72 years before the founding of Georgetown, it is very easy for us to understand how the leadership of this university was deeply entwined with the system of slavery. One does not wake up one day and imagine the possibility of human bondage. It has to be in, deeply ingrained in a culture in which the possibility of selling human beings um, is reasonable and legible. So we have a sense of how slavery animated the life of Georgetown between the year 1789 and 1862 when slavery was finally abolished in the state of Maryland. And in the middle of that history, we have the sale of 1838. If you haven't had an opportunity to look at the working group report, we have it available online at slavery.georgetown.edu. We also have it in print form. You will understand the context in which the sale was made as a move to not only relieve the university of some of its financial debts, but also consistent with what was happening in Washington at that time. The other thing that I think is important to understand about slavery at Georgetown, the evidence of it that we have in the archives of the Maryland um, province shows that it was not only Jesuit slaveholding that formed this experience. It was individual students coming to campus with slaves. It was a university contracting slave labor. It was an entire nation dependent on this system of inequality in order to grow. One of the books that we read as a working group community was Craig Wilder's Ebony and Ivy. And he talks about the way that the system of slavery helped build American colleges and universities. And he talks about the slave labor, and he talks about the sale of slaves to finance schools, but he talks about something that I think is equally important. The fact that the intellectual ideas about racial inferiority and racial superiority also allowed that system to grow. And we have to remember it's not just our actions or our access to wealth that can perpetuate the cycle of inequality. It's also the ideas we generate, the research we create, and the ways that we teach students around these ideas. So the charge from President DeJoya came in August of 2015. And President DeJoya asked us to make recommendations on how to best acknowledge the university's relationship to the institution of slavery, examine and interpret Milady and McSherry Halls, in the process of reopening these halls for residential use to ask questions about what these names meant and to convene events to share the history and initiate dialogues about this history. When we started the working group process, I think for many of us, we felt like these tasks were simple and executable ideas, right? We can think about the names and we can think about these events. But as our work continued, and the stories of the descendants of that 1838 sale emerged, it became clearer and clearer that this work was not just for the Georgetown community, that perhaps we were engaged in a process that it could also inform our peer institutions as well as members of the Catholic faith about how to contend with the choices made in the past and the way that their legacy continues. So one of the things that I think is so important when we talk about the working group is the context in which this work happened. When we convened in the summer of 2015, we were two months from the shooting of nine um, members of the Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina. The fact that African American worshipers were targeted by white supremacists in their own church chilled the nation and reopened a conversation about the appropriate use of the Confederate flag at the State House in Charleston, or at Columbia, South Carolina. And so the context in which we were doing this work was very much informed by this most recent moment of racial terror in a place of worship. Additionally, I think a lot of our work is definitely informed by the movement for black lives that has merged in the past two and a half years to ask questions about racial injustice as it relates to law enforcement, education, access to healthcare, and the myriad ways that we see the legacies of the history that we were examining at Georgetown. 
student protest on campus definitely informed a lot of the questions we asked about how Georgetown understands this past, how we memorialize it appropriately, and how it informs the experiences our students have on campus. The conversation at Yale University about retaining the name of Calhoun, of John C. Calhoun on the residential college, and relics like this, um, this is a stained glass window um, that shows slaves picking cotton, and the question of what do these symbols mean on a campus in the 21st century. And finally, I think Pope Francis. Pope Francis and President Obama are representations of two things that growing up people said I would never see, an African-American president and a Jesuit pope. Um, <laughs> you, know, so, you know, you think you're, these, these must be end times and I see both of these things at the same time. And so Pope Francis's visit in the fall also helped us imagine a pope who speaks directly to the people of his church and asks them to hold themselves accountable to the greatest standards of justice. And so the framework of our work um, has included permanent names for Freedom and Remembrance Halls, the temporary names that were given to McSherry and Milady <coughs> Halls, um, enriching our university archives so that they're available to people who are seeking to understand this history, as well as the individuals whose family trees um, have extended from Georgetown University slaveholding. Um, we had a subcommittee on ethics and reconciliation to imagine a place where Catholics of all backgrounds could come together and reconcile this past, as well as some of the ethical questions that still arise in our practices on and off campus around slavery and freedom. Thinking about the local history of Washington, D.C. was important for this process, and we've initiated important steps to um, routinize the celebration of Emancipation Day here in Washington, D.C. in April. Um, memorials on campus that make sure that they tell the full story of how Georgetown was built and outreach to communities like this one to tell this remarkable story in ways that people can feel inspired and people can see as an invitation and a call to come closer to the Georgetown community. So there are always a lot of questions in a process like this. The first question is how do we appropriately and respectfully engage the many descendants that emerge not only from the sale of the 272, but the many people who were enslaved on Jesuit plantations in Maryland, and the many people who enriched the university through their labor. How do we engage them in a way that honors that legacy and invites them to work with us and join us in a process towards reconciliation? How does the black Catholic community in Washington, D.C. understand this exploration? And how will we inspire peer institutions to also engage this history in ways that are responsible. Here is the opportunity in front of us. We can create an example for peer Catholic and Jesuit institutions about institutional history and practice. And I know a number of us on the working group have already been approached by Catholic institutions, Ivy League schools, and other peer institutions about doing this work. How do we understand the university's role in responding to the ways that slavery's legacy is pervasive and insidious today? Whether it's our racial justice projects in Ward 7, the classes that we provide our students so that they feel like they have the capacity to do justice in the world, how do we understand this history as part of that? How do we move beyond the stories of individuals to discuss how universities create structures of inequality? I want us to be very clear that this working group isn't just an opportunity for people to trace their, his, their individual family histories. This is not an iteration of roots from the 1970s. This is a call to rethink all of the practices that we have with us today as an institution that rely and thrive on inequality. And finally, how do we transform our campuses into places where racial justice work is generated and modeled so that when our students graduate Georgetown and return for their 30th and 40th and 50th anniversary, they don't feel like they have already seen this happen before, rather that they're given the space and the ideas to imagine a much better future. 
So with that, I hope this conversation today really helps you understand the work that has been so formative for all of us in the working group. Um, for me, as a scholar who's had a lot of great opportunities tied to my scholarly work, I got to see President Obama on a panel um, here at Georgetown University. I've had lunch with Eric Holder. As a graduate student, I remember having dinner with Father Berrigan and talking about anti-war activism as a Catholic. But I can't think of a moment that was more gratifying than meeting 40 descendants of this 272 for brunch on Sunday after attending mass and just hearing their family story. So this is what we can do when we are our best selves at this institution. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, there was a splendid introduction. It gave us some of the facts, some of the context, and some of the challenges. And now we're gonna have a conversation uh, with three people who have, I think, unique backgrounds. Uh, we have a scholar, a Jesuit priest, a member of the working group. We have a theologian who taught for 20 years at Georgetown, uh, has, has spent great focus on racial and, ac and social justice and uh, Catholic social thought. And then we have a Georgetown graduate who is helping our leadership uh, respond to the recommendations, and we think that will provide a good overview of sort of the challenges ahead. Let me begin with Father Carnes. Uh, you, I think, grew up in Northern California. I did. Uh, you've spent, you've been in a lot of different places. Uh, you, you know, Fordham, Stanford, uh, Notre Dame, and then you came to Georgetown in uh, 2009, I think. But of more interest, at least to me, is you've been in lots of places in Latin America, including helping respond to Hurricane Mitch. Uh, you became a Jesuit in, um, uh, you were ordained in 2003. When did you take vows? Uh, well, I entered in 1992. 1994, yeah. So, uh, and I was reading a column you wrote, uh, I think it was last year, and you said, uh, and you've done lots of other things. You're a Jesuit in residence, you've won teaching awards, uh, you uh, were a part of the working group, but I read this column you wrote about a year ago, and in that you said, our, committee, our community is also committed to the idea that we are at our best when we have the hard conversations. Sometimes there's a temptation to avoid the hard questions. So I'm gonna ask you what I think a lot of people have been asking themselves, which is, how could this happen? How could Jesuits own slaves? How could they sell slaves? How could they tr baptize people and then treat them in this way? Um, what were the attitudes and interactions of the Jesuits at that time? And then later I wanna ask you, what is there in the Jesuit tradition that will help us think about how we set this right. But first of all, the question that occurs to a lot of us who so admire the Society of Jesus, how did this happen? Yeah. You know, it's a fabulous question. It's one that I asked myself often as I reflected on this. And you mentioned that I uh, come from California and there was a temptation, I think, early on when I first learned of this history before I ever came to Georgetown to think that's some distant history. It must have been some other misguided Jesuits that were there on the East Coast. But what this has been a deep, deep confrontation for me of is, no, these are Jesuits who were as much a product of their times, as much as deeply involved in their own vows. They took the same vows I've taken. That this is something that really is, is something that both they were prone to, but our own humanity is prone to. Um, you know, when I think about the Jesuits that made these decisions, they were very much a product of their time. Um, they were a product of their time in the economic relations that were here in the United States. Um, you, know, you said, how could this happen among Jesuits? We could say, how did this happen in the United States, right? How did this happen in a society that could so regularly and callously live with the contradiction of seeing people moving on these same streets? I mean, it's striking to think about it. on these same streets right here around Georgetown. You had uh, free people of color and you had enslaved people. And people somehow walked around, white and black, and somehow just kind of saw this world as somehow, in their mind, making sense. And that, boy, it seems so foreign to me now. Economically, it seemed to make sense by the, the rules of the day. 
and the Jesuits bought into that. And strikingly, it was the American-born Jesuits that bought into it most. It was the ones themselves that had grown up on plantations, both in Virginia and Maryland. They themselves had had families that were slaveholding. And that was something that they just so imbibed that it was part of the day. Now, Jesuits from Europe sometimes raised questions about this, and so sometimes said this doesn't seem appropriate. Already by 1835, if the sale is 1838, in 1835, there are major protests here in Washington, D.C. Um, for emancipation. So Jesuits were hearing those conversations, and some were saying, yeah, this is right. We need to work change. But they were a minority voice, and they quickly caved. And I often ask myself, which was worse, those Jesuits that really deeply believed in slavery or those that raised questions and then were willing to be complicit and say, well, it's too much trouble. I can't convince everybody. I'll just go along with this. And then there were some voices that were saying, you know, let's work for some sort of middle option. Let's, you know, eventually uh, manumit them. Maybe they can earn or sort of pay off their, um, uh, their enslaved status. So there were all these different ideas floating around, but the ones that won the day were that strong voice saying that we should use this, what they looked at as capital at the time, these bodies that were sold as capital, and let's use it to, in a sense, pay down this debt. So there was a fault, I'd say there's a lack of vision, a lack of moral vision at that point. But one thing I wanted to point out about this, since we're talking about Catholic social thought here, um, is how much Catholic social thought has e evolved since that time, and how much they were limited in their time by what was the thought of the day. So what was the dominant view of the day in Catholic thinking? It was basically a Thomistic worldview. And in a Thomistic worldview, there is this almost great chain of being, right? You've got God, and then you've got human beings. And within human beings, there are even distinctions, right, between man and woman, and you have enslaved people, and you can make your way down that whole chain of being. And that would have been the dominant idea that was floating around in their time. There was no concept of social sin. That's actually an evolution that we see only in the later uh, 19th century, and especially in the 20th century, does it get developed. Um, there was very limited use of the Bible that talks about justice in so many different places <coughs> in a way that they would not have had the same exegetical skills that we did. And so they were trapped both by the economy of their day and by the theological thinking of their day. And there's a way now that even the most basic student that takes a, a catechism class in the United States, you know, will learn about social sin. And we'll have this idea that we can talk about a sin that is not just an individual choice, but that's actually the collective choice of a society that's in, in, uh, ingrained in a way that it uh, has a life of its own. And they simply didn't have that vision. Um, it's one that we've actually now evolved to have. And it's one that we can now talk about in a way that's deeply meaningful for our own age. And so there was a way where I think they were, they were so embedded in their times that they couldn't see. You know, Marsha mentioned uh, our Ethics and Reconciliation Committee. And one of the things that that committee reflected on a lot as we thought about these issues is, what are we blind to today? What are the, the, the areas that are escaping our vision right now, either because they're the economic norm or because they go, along, go beyond our theological vision? Where are the edges that we haven't yet seen? Because those are the places where we become profoundly complicit and where future generations will hold us responsible as they start to reflect on this all the more. Um, so that's where I saw them deeply embedded and entrenched in this. We're all uh, better than our worst moments, and this was a bad moment. Uh, not a moment, as was pointed out. This is a bad century. Uh, but we're also familiar with the wonderful work of the Society of Jesus. You think of what goes on every day here at Georgetown. I think of the Crystal Ray schools around the country that are providing uh, opportunity and hope to young uh, African Americans and Latinos. Two things, how does this history, this complicity you called it, and Jesuit values, Jesuit, the core of Jesuit identity, uh, Ignatian uh, spirituality and principles, how should that shape the commitments of the Society of Jesus and institutions that take their uh, direction? from Jesuit identity and Catholic social teaching. So you know, the Jesuits in the late 20th century have reflected a lot on Jesuit identity and Jesuit mission. And one of the most important moments of that was our 32nd General Congregation, a moment when the Society of Jesus, in a sense, relaunched itself, trying to name what's its mission today. And when it did that, it named the core of Jesuit identity as being a sinner who is loved by God and called to serve, a sinner first, a sinner. And that recognition of oneself as a sinner actually in a way is liberating because it actually names the honest truth 
and then allows God's grace to come in and actually inspire us to start acting in a way that can work towards reconciliation. And so beginning in that very key identity, it's one that shows up in the spiritual exercises, it's the movement of the first week of the spiritual exercises, where the Jesuit comes into this sense of, oh, I've been so profoundly loved by God in spite of my involvement in so many structural sins and personal sins, and that becomes an inspiration to act. But you know, the spiritual exercises end then with a line that reminds us that deeds are more important than words. And so that understanding of oneself then gives birth to real action, real committed action that says, I need to work to address the, uh, the sin in which I've been in involved, the inequality that, uh, that uh, characterizes the day in which I live. And Jesuits, when we interpreted that in the tw late 20th century, said that's about justice. That's a work for justice. So out of our faith in being loved sinners comes an impetus to acting in the world for justice. And that's been going out of a lot of our comfort zones, um, going into spaces where both we talk about issues that are hard. So in my own teaching, you know, inequality has become one of the central features that I talk about. I now teach classes on it because I think it's really the defining issue of our day. But Jesuits for decades here in the DC area, here on the East Coast, and more broadly, committed themselves to in, uh, uh, areas that were economically disadvantaged, and those predominantly were uh, um, filled with people of color, so uh, with uh, uh, African-American descendants of slaves, Latino recent immigrants. These are the places where Jesuits have said, we preferentially want to be serving. These are the communities in which we want to be accompanying them and actually having them teach us what our mission is in the world today. And so that sort of work then gave birth to the schools you mentioned, the Cristo Rey schools, those that say, can we make uh, Jesuit uh, education accessible in places where it wasn't before, especially places of limited economic resources, nativity schools that say, let's try to reach children before they get to those um, ages where they might start slipping out of the system. Let's reach them in middle school. And so Jesuits have really doubled down on that idea and said, this has got to be a key part of what we do. Um, so out of that, it's, it's, it's interesting how recognizing our own complicity reading the signs of the times, you know, the context of the day, invited us into each of these activities. And I don't think there's ever been a sense that this is somehow um, uh, a way of making amends. I don't think that we see it as a way that we could ever make amends or in a sense uh, have reparations for our own slaveholding history. It's more, what's the call of justice today? If that was injustice then, what is justice today? And how do we act for justice today? And we're constantly looking for the growing edges of that um, and trying to, to do more in those spaces not just in words, but, but in deeds. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. Maybe at, as we move towards the end of this, we can ask for ourselves, what is the call for justice today for us and for Georgetown? Diana Hayes, uh, you're not a Jesuit. Uh, no. <laughs> the, uh, you're a distinguished uh, academic. Uh, you graduated from uh, the State University of New York. You have two theology degrees from Catholic U. Uh, you got a law degree at GW. Uh, I think you were the first African-American woman to get a pontifical degree from Louvain. I bet that was fun. Um, <laughs> Not really. And, uh, and you have committed your work as a theologian to the intersection between faith and justice, racial justice, social justice, gender justice. I got to know Diana when we, she was in school, and we hired her to be our representative to the DC uh, government, which was also a lot of fun. Uh, working with Mayor Barry, uh, uh, working with the city council, uh, and you knew right away how smart she was and how thoughtful she was, and that uh, she would make a difference, and she has. 20 years here at Georgetown, uh, you were teaching about this and talking about this when the rest of us barely understood this. So my question, and you've written eight, nine books? Yes. Uh, more articles. You have wonderful titles for your books. I, I won't go through them. But uh, my question is, given your work at the intersection of faith and Catholic social teaching, how do the principles of Catholic social teaching help us understand what happened and what needs to happen. Okay. Uh, well, let me start sort of at the beginning of how I got into all of this, which was at Georgetown when I arrived in the fall of 1988. And within almost a month, I think, 
of my uh, being in the theology department, I was approached by several students from the uh, Black Student Alliance, I think, isn't it called? Uh, and they had two questions for me. What was I going to do about the fact that the Jesuits held slaves? That left my jaw hanging because uh, I had not heard of it before. And then the other one was they wanted an African-American studies department. So those, <laughs> they sort of set my agenda <laughs> immediately as soon as I, like I said, within three or four weeks of, of arriving. And uh, we did eventually get a certificate program, and I'm very glad to see that now there is a department, I understand, of African-American studies. It took a little longer uh, for the slavery issue to be dealt with, but I was overjoyed when I read uh, in the papers, uh, I live in Georgia now, Stone Mountain, Georgia, uh, which has its own history, I'm sure many of you know from King's uh, dream speech. Um, but being approached that way, one of the first things I did was, went to, was go to Lowinger and look at the archives and look at the records. And I always say we Catholics are very good at keeping records, even the bad ones, we, we keep them. And so I was able to read the sales, the things you were just showing, the contract and the diary of the young man who was sent years later to see how our people were doing in Louisiana. And I have to admit, I was just shaken. I really was, because it had just never occurred to me that uh, the Jesuits or that, you know, I knew Catholics had been slaveholders, but this was very close to home. And especially in light of the teachings of the church, um, especially that, that emphasis uh, in Catholic social teachings of the dignity of the human person, that all human beings have a right to be treated uh, with care, with justice, that we have rights and responsibilities toward all human beings because all human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. And one of the things that I kept puzzling over was if we are all created in the image and likeness of God, why were some images seen as lesser than others? And grew to, you know, and, and again, studying and doing research, realized that that was because uh, in the United States or in the Americas, but especially in the United States, the whole idea of race based on color came into existence as a result of the issue of slavery in many ways. And African peoples were not seen as human beings. So therefore you were not, uh, how do I put it? You were not uh, denying the human sacredness, the sacredness of the human person of an African person because they were not persons. They were animals. They were chattel. They were bits of paper on which you wrote names that you made up and then decided what to do with them. Um, so that major, that, that major foundation of Catholic social justice teaching uh, was literally torn apart by that self-understanding. It goes all the way back to, you could say, our dualistic Western understanding of the world, uh, either or as opposed to both and people. So you have the ignoring of this major tenant of Catholic social teaching, and from that one comes other tenets, the rights and responsibilities of human beings toward other human beings, the uh, dignity of work, the especially, most recently, the preferential option for the poor and the marginalized. But if you don't think of a people as a people, Catholic social justice teaching doesn't apply to them. And this was one of the major uh, issues that had to be overcome in many ways in order for persons of African descent to be considered as human beings and therefore to have the rights that all human beings have as a result of their co-creation by God. So, especially as you said, uh, Father Carnes, it, the whole history of the Catholic social teachings really only begins in 1891 with Rerum Novarum and uh, Pope Leo XIII. Prior to that, you did not have that same sort of understanding. It wasn't vocalized in the exact same way. It's only been since 1891 that you see this chain of 
traditions and statements that deal with this idea of social teaching and the responsibility, therefore, that all Christian persons have for other, all, for other Christian persons. But again, how do you bring the person of color into that understanding? In some ways, we're still grappling with that question today. Uh, if you look at what's going, the, the whole thing that, you, again, you had up Black Lives Matter, because for many persons of African descent, they still feel that they are not being treated as human beings, but that to whom is owed particular rights and also responsibilities bestowed on them by the Creator God. So you have uh, still an, an imbalance, I guess you would, you would call it. Uh, I found the best expression just recently um, of contemporary understanding of Catholic social teachings in uh, Pope Francis's newest encyclical, Laudato Si, on care for the human, on care for our common home, in which he talks about the importance and the interconnectedness of all of creation, human beings, animals, insects, but the earth itself as a whole, and how this leads us to certain responsibilities in terms of caring for our common home, which also leads to our caring for human beings. And then moving from that, he, he goes into the Eucharist and other social justice issues and tries to bring them all together into a whole, which we're still trying to do. It's not, not complete, but that, that is the best example I've seen, and I recommend it to all of you to read, because he is at least trying to show that so many of those who have been marginalized, who have been damaged uh, because of their poverty, because of their skin color, um, have not been seen as human beings. And we need to, to work our way through that still today. Diana, you said so eloquently that we didn't even think of people as people, right. the denial of human dignity. That's a judgment on the past. How, in a damning judgment, how do you think Catholic social thought and its principles can guide us now in the future? You talked about responsibility. Mm -hmm. What are the principles in Laudato Si and the Pope's words and frankly the ways he acts that should guide a university, right. should guide the church, should guide a nation to wrestle with this legacy which still continues? Again, to go back to that central core of Catholic social teaching, the dignity of all human persons. All human beings are sacred and should be uh, not only seen as sac sacred, but acted towards as sacred, which leads to the, uh, especially I think one, uh, another cornerstone, the preferential option for the poor and the least among us. How do we then approach people who have historically been on the bottom of history? How do we here at Georgetown learn about uh, the history of not just the descendants, but African peoples as a whole? Because these 272 people are important because of Georgetown, but they're just a part of a vast, you know, millions of people uh, who were brought from Africa, brought to the United States, and as I said, treated as animals, as chattel, as property. Um, and so when they were bought and sold, it was not recognized that they had these rights. How do we learn about them? How do we expand our understanding and our knowledge of, especially in the Catholic Church, the history and experience of persons of African descent? Most people think African peoples became Catholic in the United States as a result of slavery. I can't tell you how many people tell me that. Uh, when in actuality, of course, the first African convert was the Ethiopian eunuch. So you could say the year one of Christianity. There were African Catholics, of course, as we know, in North Africa. Many people don't realize that there are African Catholics in the Congo who were brought as Catholics to the United States along with others. So we need to learn that history about our Christianity, our Catholic Christianity, uh, and the presence and role of persons of African descent in that, that, uh, that uh, history. Um, what we're doing here with the, uh, the group, uh, what was it, the ethics and responsibility or reconciliation, um, is an excellent place to start. I think of uh, the black bishops 
uh, pastoral letter, which came out in 1984, What We Have Seen and Heard. And they have a wonderful section where they talk about the meaning and significance of reconciliation, how it cannot be an uneven giving, one's giving and another's taking, but that there has to be equality in terms of that reconciliation so that it's, there's a balance that exists in, in terms of that uh, reconciliation and how then reconciliation becomes an act of justice. That's very helpful. James, uh, you have a little bit different role. You were not on the working group. Uh, you didn't teach for 20 years at Georgetown. Uh, you uh, graduated from uh, North Carolina, from Georgetown. North Carolina first, then came to Georgetown. Now you have a PhD at Georgetown. You were a journalist, right? Mm -hmm. Associated Press. And now you come back, uh, having studied history, uh, liberal studies here, and you've been asked very modest tasks <laughs> to help the leadership of the university respond to these realities, these recommendations. Uh, first of all, our prayers are with you. Yeah. Uh, they are appreciated. <laughs> secondly, uh, the question. Uh, this has been a stunning sort of experience. Uh, as, as Ray said, the whole world's watching. Uh, but lots of different people have been involved. Students protested. Alumni researched, uh, faculty and others got together. The president responded with amazing leadership. Uh, the contrast, frankly, between the leadership we're not seeing in the campaign and the leadership we are seeing from President DeJoya is just stunning. As you are in touch with all those different constituencies, what has your experience been? How are people responding? And what opportunities does that create? What obstacles okay. are in the way? Well, first of all, let me say that I've been in the, lurking in the background for several years. Um, my first involvement with the story of Jesuit slavery, Jesuit slaveholding in Maryland, <clears throat> was not as a member of the working group, but as a graduate student working with Adam Rothman six year, almost six years ago, wow. where we talked about the prevalence of slavery in the new world in a time of revolution. So you've got this juxtaposition of the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the French Revolution, all taking place at the same time that slave societies are being constructed in the, in the Americas. And I will never remember, I will never forget, rather, the Friday morning in November of 2010, where I taught two sections of the Atlantic World History course, and I led off with a question, okay, imagine a group of Jesuits that hold a number of people in slavery, and they have a discussion about what to do for, for decades. And what do you think they do? What do you think they did? Emancipation, limited manumission, uh, selling, some other option. All my students thought every other option except for selling. And when I told them, no, this is this is what happened. 272 people were sold. Uh, the proceeds, some of which, some some of the proceeds from that sale went to benefit various Jesuit projects, including building debt at Georgetown College. And my students were all stunned. So, so in that sense, I was lurking in the background. Um, over the course of my doctoral studies, I studied labor and labor history. And so I grew up on the, on the words of Pope Leo XIII's encyclical Rerum Novarum from 1891 and the dignity of labor. And then in 2015, as the protests around the renaming, around uh, the reopening of then Mullady Hall <coughs> led to the constitution of the working group and its, and its work. I was um, happily working as a TA with Professor Chadlin and learning a lot of the ins and outs of, of what's, what's, what the working group was then pulling together. 
So even though I haven't been directly involved, um, I now step into this position at a time where we're now trying to transition from an understanding of the past and trying to figure out how to apply this to the present and the future. And so let me use that to, to go into the response of various communities. Um, there's been a, it's been a, there's been a tremendous response. We're, we're now six weeks since President DeJoya issued the report and accept, accepted the report, gotta get my terminology right, from the working group. And we've been at work trying to figure out how to go forward with implementing the, the recommendations and this is important and with the participation of descendants of students of the Jesuits, um, the university community, people of goodwill. So the response has been interesting, shall we say. Um, some people, it seems, seems that some of the response has been guided by a feeling that this report is the final act, that things will be done and we'll go back into our respective routines and everything will go happily ever after. And I don't think that what, I don't think people have begun to really grasp the significance of the working group report being a start rather than an end point. We're at the very start of a very long process of which all these various entities will need to talk with each other, not at each other, not over each other, and not to each other, but with each other. And so let me pause there because I want, I want you to come back with another question so we can go a little bit deeper. I should have indicated this earlier that if you want to participate in our conversation, you can at hashtag GU272 at GUCST Public Life. That's hashtag GU272 at GUCST Public Life. I want to take a little bit of a diversion okay. and talk about your uh, academic life. You've studied work and slavery independent of this particular set of responsibilities. What are the forms of slavery alive today in our economy, in our country, in our world? Okay, two years ago, I designed and taught a course about, I tinker with the title, I thought it might be American neo-slavery, then I decided to be more neutral. But the idea was centered around the question, did the 13th Amendment actually end slavery in the United States as we know it? Or did it push the practice into other areas. And so my intrepid seven students and I, because it was a seminar, we studied sharecropping, we studied the convict lease system, we studied um, the, the ends, the, the difficulties and um, really tough parts of policing the domestic economy. How, how does a domestic do work in a house how much does labor, how, how well do labor laws cover that person? Uh, we looked at farm workers in, in numerous incidents. And so we, we bridged the gap of 150 years from 1865 up to 20, to the present. And really, you know, now, nowadays there are practices trafficking into forced labor. There are other, other types of, of labor that is coerced, not freely given. There are types of labor that are not adequately protected, both legitimate and illegitimate, uh, both you know, above ground and underground. And so the, the idea is that, that even though we have passed an amendment that effectively bans uh, slavery, we still have these practices that could very well be described in some terms by some people as slavery, relate, you know, relating to um, a farm worker not getting paid the proper amount, not getting paid minimum wage, um, the, the prison industrial complex. You know, how does that restrict people by keeping them out of the, the, 
the labor market. So you know, there, there are many ways of, of looking at this. And, and I think that, that speaks to why this particular story at this particular time has such uh, resonance. Because yes, we're talking about a university that in part had benefited from slave labor. And that way, that in that sense, benefiting from the denial of that dignity, you know, the, the denial of pay, the denial of people being able to work and produce for themselves and for their, their families and their communities. But we're, we're, it's, it's highly ironic to me that Pope Leo XIII could issue this encyclical in 1891 during an era that was considered um, you know, the Gilded Age, and we're having similar conversations right now in the 2010s, 2016, around inequality. Uh, we talk about how, in, in, in various, in various uh, disciplines, we talk about how lack of access to um, economic advancement is one of the recipes for radicalization. And yet we're seeing a lot of this in the United States at this point. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, where, where, can, we, where can we step in? Uh, how can we step in with our Jesuit identity, our Jesuit values? And one of those things I think, you know, um, Father Carnes had said that we cannot necessarily, um, I'm going to paraphrase you for a second here, that we cannot necessarily recoup or right the wrong that has been done, but we can do justice today. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why this moment in particular matters uh, with regard to the work of the working group, with regard to the conversations that we're trying to have with various entities and people um, around how to figure out what reconciliation looks like. Mm -hmm. And if I could finally say this, sure. we think that this is a difficult conversation to have because you know, some people will say, oh, well, slavery was so long ago. And one of the things I like to say is this. Well, if, if slavery was so long ago, then you may want to stop talking about the Constitution <laughs> because that's older than, than this institution of slavery in the United States. You might want to start, stop talking about the Reformation because that was older than slavery. You might want to stop talking about the nation state going back to the 1640s because that is older than, than 180 years ago. And you might want to stop talking about the Magna Carta and common law <laughs> at 800 years. And the point, you know, I mean, it's funny, but at the same time, the, the point that I'm trying to make is we live in a society that is built on all of these things that are hundreds, even thousands of years old. If you look at the, if you, if you go to Judaism and look at the, 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 the slavery tale for Passover, thousands of years old. So if we can talk about it in those terms, if we can talk about these, these various entities that, that help form the foundation of our society, we can talk about slavery. We just have to find the right tools in which to talk about it. Well, for Christians, the gospel, I think, exactly. predates yes. slavery. Uh, I'm going to invite our audience to uh, join this conversation. I think there are going to be some mics uh, that are placed. Uh, let me, as we make this transition, ask uh, what may be a too personal question, and I'll invite you, Marsha, to join us. Uh, each of us, in our own way, talked about how this affected us. Father talked eloquently about his religious community. Diana talked about how stunned she was to see what she saw. Your Catholic laywoman talked about how this affected your faith. The, you've been talking about Rare Novarum. When you are a part of a family of faith, when you do have institutional loyalty to this great place, how does it challenge you to be so clearly confronted by institutional evil uh, done by religious people, by the people who built this? And what is our obligation as carriers of those values to set things right? If, uh, if anybody can jump in, maybe Marsha first. I mean, and then we'll have a uh, chance for questions. 
as a as a U.S. historian, you know, nothing surprises me. Um, no institution of this age and prestige and location could have clean hands when we think about the institution of slavery and its pervasiveness. And to be honest with you, I'm more troubled by my personal experiences of racism within the church than the historical legacy and the foundation of American Catholicism. And so I think that this is the place that can have the most impact on our faith. It's our, it's our personal experiences that are grounded in this legacy and the way that we have to reconcile um, the alienation of being part of a family and um, the comfort that faith can provide and even the limits of faith in that, in that sense. Diana? I'm a convert to Catholicism and many people think I'm insane for doing so. Uh, something I do um, question we're, occasionally. We're glad you're here. I'm, so, I'm sort of glad to. It's never boring, that's for sure. Um, we, we don't feel that way about everybody. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad. Mm. But when I first went to Catholic U to start studying, one of the things that struck me was that there were no, I'd never heard about any black people in, in the church or anything like that, even though I know, knew I was not the only one, thank God. Um, but as I, then one of my professors told me about Dr. James Cone, Black Liberation Theology, and that was really a sort of a mind changer for me. And as I began to explore that and began to explore um, black Catholic history and wondering what had happened there and began to realize how little people knew about black Catholic history. So th that really sort of set, you could say, my whole life into uh, a path of trying to uncover a history that I knew had to exist, but I could find no records of initially until I started doing my own exploring and going to libraries, and especially when I went to Europe and was able to find more material on the African presence in, in Catholicism, and then coming back and being confronted by my students. So my whole life literally has been one of trying to retrieve uh, a history that has, uh, as some people have said, been lost, stolen, or strayed somewhere along the way, to try and rebuild that history to help people to understand that Christianity as a whole and Catholicism as a whole is much broader than they ever realize, that it's not just a European history or a Euro-American, it's a world history, and that persons of color have been a part of that history. There have been moments, like I said, when I read the, the materials on slavery here at Georgetown and other moments when I've, the treatment of women, things like that, that have sort of um, given me pause, but it really has challenged me even more. It just made me even more determined to sort of dig out and uncover this stuff and write about it and to, so that people could understand where I was coming from as an African American and where Latino Americans are coming from and everything, when we're talking about what it means to us to be a part of this world church um, that sometimes has been wonderful to us and at other times has not. Mm -hmm. That's our history and we're trying to bring it out. Mm -hmm. you know, to e echo that idea, um, so I've now been here uh, eight years and my walk each morning takes me by the Jesuit cemetery as I make my way to my office over at ICC. And for many years, I would just kind of say a little silent prayer towards those guys, you know, get me through tenure, you know, make this a good <laughs> class today, you know, kind of like show me your support. And over the years, though, I started to explore the cemetery a little bit. Um, and actually, a few years ago, I started doing a thing I call the secret Jesuit tour. And I call it just secret because students come if you call it secret. Um, they want to find out where are the secrets. Um, and for years, I took them through sort of the really uh, beautiful parts of our history, and in fact, parts of the history that I only partially understood. Mm -hmm. And one of the key parts I used to talk about a lot was Patrick Healy. Um, and Patrick Healy is incredibly inspiring in the sense of, you know, son of a slave-holding uh, man and a slave that was held by that man in, in Georgia. Um, and then eventually uh, becomes a Jesuit, eventually becomes president of the university. And so there's a real inspiration there in that story, although very complicated as well, because at the death of his father, he, became, he inherits the slaves that his father held. So I mean, think about how complicit this was. But because of this work on the working group, I now go to other graves, and one of the graves that I never would have even looked for before is Maletti's grave. And when I go there with students, I tell them the story of Thomas Maletti. And we talk about how complicit he was in the, 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 the space of his day. 
And often students are really shaken by this, to think that, oh, we can go from this inspiring figure who was part of that history, caught up in that history, to someone who was caught up in a very different way, in a less inspiring way. And then when I have the time, now there's one third place I go, and it's actually the most moving to me, and it takes a longer walk. And that's when we go up to Holy Rood Cemetery. And so at Holy Rood Cemetery, you can see the family graves of the Beecrafts. Okay, the Beecrafts were a free black family here in DC. Um, Anne Marie Beecraft, for whom we named uh, the, the meditation center now, uh, uh, Anne Marie Beecraft Hall, she was a free woman of color who, working with the Jesuit pastor of Holy Trinity, founded a school for free black girls here. You think about this, at a time when she's walking down the streets and seeing other people that look just like her enslaved, she's then working with people that look like just like her to be able to move forward in their own um, lives. What a vision to be able to do that, and what courage to be able to do that. And, and here she is, a deep person of faith herself, who surely would have prayed by those graves. And so when I go there every time, I find myself praying for the way she must have felt when she walked those streets. And then later, she ends up entering religious life and enters the first uh, um, uh, sustained community of African-American uh, women religious in the United States. So it's by actually entering more deeply into the complicity of the history, the complexity, I should say, of the history, that I find some real inspiration. But it means going through the hardest part. You know, if you don't go through Thomas Maletti, you won't understand why Henry B. Craft is so important. Mm -hmm. But when you do, you become inspired by her in a way that can say, even now we can keep learning from that experience, which was mm -hmm. challenging in its day. It was, I mean, it took a kind of bravery. Um, it took a kind of faith that I really hope I can have to know how to stand up to the structures of our day. Could I just piggyback on that for a minute? Because I agree with you, um, uh, with what you're saying, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that Patrick Healy and his two brothers, uh, all, as you said, the children of a slave mother and a, a Georgia plantation owner, never acknowledged their blackness. And so their history has become, for black Catholics, sort of a, a difficult one. We honor them as the first black Catholic priest and bishop, uh, but also acknowledge that they didn't want to have anything to do with us. They completely kept themselves apart and denied any aspect of their black, you know, heritage. So that's a, a, dif a difficult legacy. Yeah, no, and that's actually something we try to enter into conversation mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. with the students because at a time when I would have told triumphantly, now it's actually much more complicated. Right. Yeah. James, quick comment. I would have to say that, that uh, my f what keeps me going when there's a particularly difficult encounter in the work that we're doing now is the realization that when we carry out the best of what the Jesuits represent, that we're laying the groundwork for this country, this university, this society, whatever, whatever unit you want to put it in, to be better, to be truer, and you know, as a historian, I, I understand that there's a lot of despicable stuff that has happened, you know, when I study U.S. history. But there's also this idea of a promise. And when, when we do the right thing, when we try to do the right thing, I feel that we get closer to that point where we have reached a place where everybody is dignified, everybody has value, everybody is able to contribute to the whole. So mm -hmm. that's my brief comment. Thank you. Sure. I see somebody there, and if you want to ask a question, there's another mic over here. Uh, we can't see you. The, they've lit us up really nice, so uh, if you would speak up, identify yourself. Uh, my name is Dan Colopy. I graduated from Georgetown 1980 with an American Studies degree, mm -hmm. but I don't recall spending more than 25 minutes talking about slavery which gives you some idea of how the university has changed over time. Um, I've not read the report. I've been relying on newspaper accounts of what Georgetown is doing. And the one part of it that I don't quite see emphasized um, enough, particularly if you think about this act of contrition we're all trying to make, which is certainly needed, uh, was the reality of being sold as a slave that had had an existence in Maryland in those plantations to be sold to Louisiana. And from what I've heard, the conditions in 1838 for slaves in this country probably could not have been more horrific in terms of the options. So it's more than just a financial transaction. And despite the caveats that were put into the sale, that they'd be allowed to continue the Catholic faith and they would keep the families together, 
I think if they were honest with themselves when they wrote that language, they knew it was completely unenforceable, probably a good wish. But in terms of the reality, they were sentencing a good number of those to their death, given the way it's been described to me. The, the book that just I've been recommending to people that I encounter to the point they're tired of me is the book The Half Has Never Been Told, The Economic History of Slavery in the United States. And it's a very compelling read, and I would encourage anyone who wants to get a real taste as the Jesuits when they do their exercises one of us sort of get into the shoes of Christ and, and experience what that's like. He does the best account that I've read about what it was like to be a slave in the 1830s in Louisiana. Could we ask maybe the two members of the working group to talk about the, the specific things that were said and done and not done? Maybe I'll start and you can go ahead. Uh, uh, so I mean, just to, to remark that that is a, a fantastic book. It's actually written by a Georgetown graduate, uh, Ed Baptist. Um, and we invited him here as part of Emancipation Week earlier this year to uh, talk about that book and, and a lot of its findings, which is really about you know, the second movement, the second huge movement of enslaved people in the United States as they're sold into the South and then into the new states they're being formed, their slaveholding states. And as you say, it is uh, some of the most egregious treatment um, in the United States, um, the harshest conditions, harshest treatment by uh, so Johnson, who's one of those that buys uh, the slaves, has a reputation as being one of the most um, violent towards his slaves, and Beatty is the other, other uh, um, uh, buyer. And they quickly start going into bankruptcies on small parts of their plantations, so then further selling the slaves that they themselves had acquired, and then those slave families being separated. So there is a, um, a, both a violence and a separation of families that happens there as well. But I think yeah. you've said it all. <laughs> Next question. So, my name is Aya Ruluba, and I'm a senior at Georgetown, majoring in government with minors in economics and African American studies. And I was glad to be introduced to Catholic social te teaching by Father Kemp in his class, Church and the Poor. So, as a member of the working group myself, and one of the things we discussed was uh, how can we make sure that this history is going to be something that's not only known, you know, five years from now, but 10, 50 yes. years from now. And then also as a student and a part of the activism on campus and really the engagement of students in the, in the work that the working group did, I would be really interested to know, I mean, I'm leaving Georgetown after this year, and for you, those of you who are going to be here for years to come, how do you really see students, the impact of the student experience at Georgetown through this history, and then how do you see further the engagement of students in the role of uh, reconciling this history? Yeah. First. Oh. Well, just first of all, thank you for your yeah. leadership and participation. Yes, I was a great student. Um, so I think that this is an important question because I think that every institution um, struggles with the uses of tradition versus nostalgia. So a lot of these arguments about keeping buildings named X or this statue Y, this is about nostalgia. Nostalgia doesn't do anything good for people. Tradition is about a series of values that can animate our institutions as the world changes around them. And so I think that we're hopefully, we're teaching students today that that is possible. But I think when we talk about how do we keep the history here, it isn't just a matter of a statue or memorial, it's giving meaning to these sites. Because we have many sites throughout our nation, especially being in Washington, D.C., that are sites of extreme violence, extreme loss, and they can become a park. They can become something cute to take a selfie with, right? At Brown University, they decided to memorialize slavery with um, a rendition of um, a weight and a chain, and people take wedding pictures there, right? Because they think it's a ball and chain joke. And this is within, this is within moments of this happening, right? So it is not just about creating the structures, it's about making sure that we're in an institutional culture that reminds us to always make meaning. And the second thing I'm gonna say, and this is um, to President DeJoy's credit, um, in 2014, weeks after the, the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, um, President DeJoya had a choice to make when he did the opening convocation speech for freshman convocation. He had a choice to make. He could talk about whatever he wanted. He's a president of this place, right? And he spent time talking about the legacy of slavery and unrest in American cities. Very small gesture, right? This changes the tone for all New Hoyas. They are now at a school where the president of the university talks about issues of critical importance at the opening convocation with their parents there and the faculty and the staff, and this fundamentally changes the culture. Students coming to Georgetown believe that part of what a university does is engage in difficult conversations about the past. 
we have now changed an institutional culture. And so sometimes it does take working groups and a lot of money and a lot of time, but sometimes it takes people at the top to just set the right tone. Okay, let's go up here. Hi, uh, my name is Daniela Montemorano. I'm a graduate student in the MSFS program here on campus. So first I would just like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of the wonderful work that you have been doing over the last couple years. Um, really to everyone in this audience for being present here tonight um, because this is really, uh, it's really holy work. Um, so along that line then of holiness, I wanted to talk about reconciliation and ask a question around that. And for Catholics, reconciliation is a cornerstone of our faith. It's one of the seven sacraments that we go through on a regular basis, and um, this is an act of public reconciliation. So how, and this might be a very personal question for, for the panel here, how has this act of public reconciliation affected your private faith? How has it affected us privately? Yeah, maybe okay. personally, maybe private, personally, a, bit of, yeah. <laughs> a mm. bit of a touchy, touchy. Well, for me, the, when I saw the first headline come on uh, my email,